Good morning. It is December 20th, 2018. My name is Katie Schenk, and today I'm here with Ense Ufat to conduct an interview for the Two Party Georgia Oral History Project, sponsored by the, Rus the Richard B. Russell Library at the University of Georgia. Ms. Ufat has dedicated her career to civil, human, and workers' rights issues. Currently, she is the executive director of the New Georgia Project, a nonprofit organization whose goal is to strengthen Georgia's democracy by registering, mobilizing, and engaging the state's eligible but unregistered African American, Asian, and Latino American residents. Previously, she worked as assistant executive director for the Canadian Association of Teachers, the country's largest faculty union. She also served as a senior lobbyist and government relations officer for the American Association of University Professors and coordinated members around legislation that impacted education and labor laws. Ms. Ufat, I am excited to speak with you today and look forward to a discussion about voters' rights and voter suppression, the role of grassroots activism in Georgia politics, and the changing demographics of the Georgia voter. Uh, so often, the focus in Georgia politics has been on the people who get to office. Um, but you know and I know there's so much more to that story, and I'm excited to speak with you today to begin to fill in some of those gaps in that narrative. So am I. Thank All you. Right. So first, let's just start with some um, basic biographical information. If you could tell us about yourself, your parents, where you were born, where yeah, you went to school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I tell people that I'm a Southerner two times over. Uh, so I was born in Nigeria uh, in uh, a quiet boom state, which is the southern part of Nigeria. Basically, it's like the... Some people say it's the Miami of Nigeria. I'm going to say yeah. that it's like it's the Atlanta okay. <laughs> of Nigeria um, and immigrated with my parents um, when I was in elementary school. Um, like my father, uh, I'm a graduate of Georgia Tech. Uh, and so uh, I'm an Atlanta Public Schools grad, uh, moved with my family when I was in elementary school to Southwest Atlanta, uh, grew up here, grew up as a sort of baby operative um, and did work for in the Georgia Democratic Party. So your parents were very politically active? Yes. Well, yes, but... but my parents, particularly my mother, was really involved in organizing um, African immigrants during a previous the the previous sort of big round of immigrant rights organizing in our country, uh, and so I was a movement baby, uh, like going to organizing meetings, party meetings. Uh, lobby visits and like sitting in the corner playing with my toys mm -hmm. um, or reading a book uh, as I got older. Uh, so yeah, I, I was a movement baby and, and have been doing sort of this kind of work, uh, I'd say most of my life. Okay, and so do you think it's like kind of osmosis or did you begin to like actually, as you got older, really listen and yeah. understand? Yeah, I think- parents brought um, you in more? Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, my parents brought me in more, but A, I also developed my own analysis, right? Mm -hmm. So that as a young woman trying to understand what's happening in the world around us, um, and sort of managing the tension, right? Like recognizing myself as an immigrant, um, but uh, you know, uh, uh, more importantly, recognizing myself as an African American mm -hmm. um, with an equal emphasis on both, right? And so trying to make sense of the world around me mm -hmm. um, required that I had an understanding of sort of power and how things work uh, and you know, what is oppression um, and uh, and then how we build power. Power, who has it? Who doesn't have it? What impact is it having on my life, mm -hmm. right? Why is why am I being paid the minimum wage uh, when at, in, at $5.15 when I'm clearly smarter than my manager, right? right. <laughs> Et cetera. Uh, so, I mean, honestly, that's where it came from. Learning to make um, sense of the world around me, uh, developing a vocabulary. Uh, that Some of it came by osmosis, but some of it came from just really a, like a, a deep curiosity and a desire to understand the world around me. And you're also coming at this from I don't know if you would say the intersection, but but two groups of African Americans, so issues of civil rights, but then as an immigrant, mm -hmm. um, issues of immigration, so Absolutely. maybe doubly attuned to oppressions. Absolutely, um, and uh, again, because I'm also not the person that sort of suffers in silence. Mm -hmm. Like you hurt me, I'm going to say ouch. 
probably really, really loudly, probably obnoxiously loud. Um, a, so that it never happens again, but B, so that like I understand where this pain is coming from and I figure out how to stop it, right? Okay. And so um, wanting to know, you know, why uh, across the globe and even in a place like Georgia where there's a long history of black wealth and black activism, right? That that race was still a powerful indicator of how successful one would be, one's life expectancy, the quality of schools that people mm-hmm. had, the quality of education that people had access to, uh, uh, the ability to accumulate wealth um, and pass it on, et cetera. The race was such a powerful determinant, even in a place like Georgia, where black folks have, or the narrative, is that black people have been doing really, really well. It's the black Mecca. Right, the black Mecca. Uh, and people have been doing really well for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, so you went to Georgia Tech. I did. Um, but then you, you left Georgia. I did. Where did you go next? Um, after I left Georgia, I went to Ohio. Okay. <laughs> Ooh, I went to Dayton, Ohio. So I went to law school uh, at the University of Dayton. Um, and... Uh, the Midwest uh, and its sort of legacy and history of progressive organizing, particularly through the lens of labor mm-hmm. um, and labor organizing, was a really important part of, again, deepening my analysis about power. Again, who has it, who doesn't, the impact that it has on my life. Um, because, again, growing up in Atlanta, you definitely get a master's level education in the civil rights movement, um, the actors. Uh, and uh, adding labor to that analysis um, was really, really helpful, right? Mm -hmm. So understanding that it was the March on Washington for jobs and freedom, right? right? Understanding that the UAW is the local, or is the union that paid for the buses that got people from across the country to Washington, D.C. for the March on Washington. Part of the narrative that isn't always told as strongly 100 percent 100 percent um and so yeah uh i was going to use this opportunity to take a shot at dayton ohio but they're already going through enough so it's not worth it we'll, we'll <laughs> let them be. right we'll, we'll let them be uh but i did i graduated um and um you know because I'm a poor kid, uh, an immigrant kid who graduated at the top of my law school class, I did what I, like a good girl. I went to work in corporate law <laughs> uh, because that's what you do. Right. Um, you and made, you made good. I yeah, I made good. I made it out. Yeah. Um, now I made tons of money, but I was also miserable mm-hmm. um, and was not really. And so I thought that I would be able to do sort of organizing and and activism as sort of my five to nine so that I would okay. work during the day and in the evenings and the weekends like I would you know work with in a battered women's shelter work to organize around police brutality uh, etc and the truth of the matter is that I was burning the candle at both ends you, you uh, left out sleep. I left out sleep, right? And like a life. <laughs> uh, and so I started having informational interviews uh, with the, you know, the chair of the Democratic Party in Montgomery County, with local labor union leaders, with, uh, you know, activists, et cetera, um, other lawyers who, people who had worked in practice as lawyers, but were not doing it currently, okay. doing other cool, interesting, amazing things. And kind of finding out how did you get right. where you are right Absolutely. now? How do I get there? How do I get there? Uh, and it led me to working in the legal department for AFSCME. Uh, which is a public employees union. Okay. Um, and yeah, the rest is sort of history. I, I guess and, that's, and that is in Ohio? In right? Ohio, okay. yeah. So worked for AFSCME um, in Ohio, representing uh, the blue collar workers at the University of Cincinnati, uh, the lunch ladies for Cincinnati Public Schools, the zookeepers at the Cincinnati Zoo uh, and the Cleveland Zoo, um, uh, the janitors at Ohio State. Uh, so I've probably negotiated and led negotiations with about 50 union contracts wow. uh, before uh, the end of my sort of legal career okay. as a labor lawyer. Um, and, you know, it put me in direct contact with um, sort of 
organ like the idea that ordinary people that we need institutions in order to uh, execute on working people's priorities on people of color's priorities on women's priorities mm -hmm. that we need institutions and that um, two of the most lasting and enduring institutions particularly for black folks but in general and um, are our unions and our churches okay right? right so they are fully funded by the membership Mm -hmm. um, and so they are accountable to the membership, right. which is no surprise that uh, historically they have been like the site of sort of a lot of resistance and pushback and progressive organizing sure. um, throughout the history of American politics. So you're seeing that even you're talking about this grassroots work, mm -hmm. but it's and it's this bottom up and you want the people to have agency, but there still has to be structure. a bigger structure right. over that. Mm -hmm. You need structure. We need structure. We need institutions, which is why I'm really proud of the work of the New Georgia Project. It's not to say that people haven't been registering young people uh, or registering black folks in Georgia. That, right. that work has been done uh, for a century. Um, right. Decades. Decades. <laughs> say, decades listen, right. 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 Do the math. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That work has been done for decades. Um, but the reason why um, we're going to win um, is because we've built independent political power um, that is not beholden to any particular party, that um, is clear that we are here in service of communities of color, young people, and women. Mm -hmm. um, that we are here in service of underrepresented uh, and underserved communities, and that we are constantly looking for vehicles by which we can um, win on an agenda for working people and for underrepresented communities. And then once we win, defend those wins beyond one election cycle, right? So right. you see what hap what's happening in Wisconsin right now, mm -hmm. which is disgusting, um, but they lost. Like Scott Walker, you lost. Republicans, you lost. Mm -hmm. And a way in and in, in in response to that devastating loss, they have not chosen the path of sort of a peaceful transition of power, right. uh, the way that we've come to expect in a democracy. Mm -hmm. They are changing the rules, uh, and they have gone into a special session, a special legislative session, to strip power from the incoming administration. Right. And so it to the extent that um, people choose to play fair and play by the rules, um, I think some of the building of a sort of multiracial, multiethnic Georgia mm -hmm. is is eventual, like it's going to happen. Right. Um, but the midterms in 2018 have taught us that they're not going to play by the rules that the rules of engagement are constantly shifting um, in the interest of those who have power. Uh, and so mm -hmm. it's our responsibility as an institution of independent political power to be able to respond to that. So it's, it's one thing to get people to register. It's one thing even to win. Mm -hmm. It's a totally different thing to maintain the power cycle after cycle, but also to do it do so fairly right. or, or to make sure who is, whoever has the power is using it. Absolutely. Or, or it's one thing to register people and it's another thing to make sure that they actually get on the rolls. Right. Right. It's one thing to register people and make sure that they actually get on the rolls. It's a totally another thing to make sure that there are voting machines. Uh, there are enough voting machines at their polling location when it comes time to vote. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So I imagine, and, and I'd like to step back in a minute and talk a little bit about how the New Georgia Project actually came to be, the nuts and bolts of building it. Okay. Um, but, you know, you talk about registration and you talk about engagement and, you know, and you talk about getting people involved. Mm -hmm. And now it seems that there's an extra step in there almost of like then fighting right. that, you know, OK, I've gotten everyone to the polls. Wait right. a minute. I did my job. And right. now I feel like the government hasn't done their job or... Well, the truth is that there's always been an extra step, right? I don't let people talk about voter apathy without talking okay. about voter suppression, right? Mm -hmm. That history has taught us that when um, marginalized groups uh, and, and underrepresented groups uh, attempt to build power for themselves and exercise that power, 
that they're met oftentimes with violent and like forceful resistance um, by the state and by those who do have power. Um, and so there was no reason for us to think that that would not be the case in Georgia. Um, it would have been naive to think it would have otherwise. Been, it would have been naive to think otherwise, absolutely. All right, so let's let's um, take a step back for a second um, to talk more about the New Georgia Project specifically. How, mm. how was the New Georgia Project born? Have you been part of it since the very beginning? Yeah, so um, the New Georgia Project was founded by Stacey Abrams. Uh, I think that as the minority leader uh, in the Georgia State Legislature, uh, she occupied a pretty unique vantage point Mm -hmm. um, to understand like where the state is right now, where the legislature is, and the direction that we're moving in. I think that, um, you know, uh, in some of our initial conversations, the idea that elected legislature, legislators in Georgia were unaccountable to, to their constituents, that there were so many safe seats in Georgia, that so many legislators, um, like they ran uncontested, mm -hmm. uh, their, seats, their races were uncontested, and that we didn't have a full, robust democracy because a million Georgians of color uh, who are eligible to participate in our elections but unregistered to vote were not participating, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so one day we were having lunch. We were introduced uh, by a mutual friend. We were having lunch about um, and having a conversation about, you know, the history of Georgia elections okay. and that over if you could look over the past five or six election cycles where the win margin between the successful candidate and the losing candidate was about 200,000 votes, um, 250,000 votes. And meanwhile, there were over a million people of color who were eligible and unregistered. And so there were nearly five times. That's pretty simple math. It's very simple math. Very Five times what was required to swing any election. I mean, and we're talking about Jason Carter losing by 200,000 votes. Michelle Nunn, uh, you know, getting bested by David Perdue for like by 197,000 votes. Um, you, you know, uh, President Obama uh, in 12, right, losing mm -hmm. by about 300,000 votes. Uh, and so that number has been pretty consistent. And what would happen? How representative would our democracy be like? Um, would it, the legislator, legislature be able to match the policy and the political priorities of the electorate um, if more people were voting, if more people of color were voting. And why not find out? Uh, and so what that's how the New Georgia Project, <laughs> what, what do we have to lose, right? Yeah. Um, and so that's how the New Georgia Project was born. Basically over a lunch. Uh, over a lunch, okay. but also with a brilliant person. Yeah. Um, I tell people all the time. With many brilliant people. Yeah, right, with many brilliant people. Um, but I tell people all the time, like, you know, I had at least 30 reasons why the New Georgia Project as an idea would w would have challenges, right? Mm -hmm. Would be met with fierce, like, vocal, organized, well-resourced opposition. Mm -hmm. And Stacey had... 31 reasons why it absolutely could work and that it had to work and that the time was now, right? Um, and so that has been, that's the origin story, right, of the organization is that, um, like, in a Georgia where we're lucky to have, you know, NAACP chapters mm -hmm. that are over a century years old, right? And we're also really lucky to have really mobilized and energetic um, and motivated white suburban moms who have formed, have organized themselves into like these new resistance groups. Mm -hmm. I call them uh, my resistinistas. Yes. <laughs> um, and so we're really lucky to have both of these. They don't always talk to each other. Right. They don't always talk well with one another. And um, one is considered sort of calcified and um, not nimble. And one is considered reckless uh, novice reckless novices mm -hmm. uh, that are sort of single issue anti-Trump voters and not actually progressives, right? Okay. And I see the role of the New Georgia Project and the role that we've occupied as sort of 
again, having a very clear analysis about power, having a very clear analysis about the policy priorities of people of color, of Georgians, and then coming up with plans to bring all of these elements of the progressive ecosystem together so that we can move beyond looking like we're, like looking good losing. Okay. And actually winning. Right. And it's not partisan. Right. Because I tell people all the time, Democrats controlled Georgia government for 100 years. Right. right. Up until the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, the, but they were Dixiecrats. Right. They were Southern right. Democrats right. Uh, who needed to be organized and pushed against uh, when it came to uh, reproductive justice, mm -hmm. when it came to civil rights, when it came to the environment. Um, Georgia Democrats, we've had to organize against them as well, historically. Okay. Uh, and so it, it, it's not a partisan issue for us. Um, it really is about the politics, uh, the small p politics, uh, and, and the policies that we're trying to push through for families. Okay. That's, because that's interesting, because I think a lot of people would question, they're like, okay, so the New Georgia Project positions itself as a nonpartisan organization, but mm -hmm. it was founded in part by mm -hmm. the minority leader who right. just ran as a Democrat mm -hmm. to um, to hold the seat of governor of right. the state of Georgia. Right. But you, you see the way to reconcile that with being that you don't necessarily align, you don't, you wouldn't have aligned with what the Democrats had been before or? Um, this is how I reconcile it, that it is about um, the hopes and the fears uh, that black Georgians and Latina Georgians have for themselves mm -hmm. and their families and their communities. And that it is our right and our responsibility to use every tool that's available to us to execute on that agenda. Right. To address right. people's fears and to like help people realize their hopes. Right. Mm -hmm. And so electoral politics, voting, we're not taking anything off the table. If there's a, a Democratic candidate or a Republican candidate who uh, shares our values, is accountable to the communities that we work with, mm -hmm. uh, then they are an ally and someone that we can work with to enact the elements of our agenda and that we are super clear about that. And again, it's, it is being responsible and accountable to the communities that we work in and saying that we are not going to take any tool off of the table that will help us win. Yeah. No, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. When you talked about how you had 30 reasons mm -hmm. that it wouldn't work and Stacey Abrams had 31, right. that's not saying that she was naive to the problems no, that you were going to face. It's saying the exact opposite, that she had thought about all of the problems that we would likely face and mm -hmm. had thought about solutions and ways to overcome them. So have all of those fears that you had been realized and then some? Uh... And then some. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, are we going to do this now? Or should we go through the list of... Let's, all... let's, let's do, do it. it. There's no time like the present. Okay, so we're talking about <clears throat> before Election Day, mm -hmm. um, exact match, right? right? It's a policy that was in Georgia that we discovered because in 2014, we registered 86,419 people to vote. Uh, by the voter registration deadline, only 46,000 of those folks had shown up on the voter rolls. So when we went to Secretary Kemp and said, hey, where are 40,000 registrants? Excuse me, we're missing some right. people. Hey, pardon me, excuse me. <laughs> um, they replied with a subpoena where they ask for all of our financial records, they ask for our list of donors, they ask for all of our emails. Um, and it was designed to have a chilling effect mm -hmm. uh, on the work that we're doing. They, they, see, they wanted to seize all of our records. Like, Whereas and, you went to question them about right. what happened, they flipped it around. Right, absolutely. Um, and because it had worked before, um, it, they didn't think twice about it. Uh, there was a group in 2012 um, called uh, the Asian American Legal Advocacy Center. They had a 10,000 Koreans campaign. Mm -hmm. 
Hmm. Um, and the idea was to register 10,000 Korean Americans um, because of the rapid growth right. uh, and naturalization rates of members of their community. So they well on their way to registering 10,000 Korean Americans. Many of the people that they registered weren't showing up on the voter rolls. They sent a letter to the Secretary of State asking for them to conduct an investigation into figuring out what, what happened. The Secretary of State then sick the GBI on them and they investigated the organization and not what was happening with the process of their voter registration form. So the GBI showed up, seized their files, and they shut down their voter registration campaign. And so because it had worked in the past, they thought that it would work again. We're going to use us. the same playbook. Absolutely. Nah. <laughs> and, and do you credit that to one, knowing that it was coming, but also you're a lawyer, right. Stacey Abrams is a lawyer. Right. Like how much does that legal training, if, if you did not have that training, right. Would you be able to do this job? Right. Um, I mean, it's it's helpful. Uh, the woman who founded the Asian American Legal Advocacy Center, Helen Kim Hall, is a dear friend, a badass organizer, uh, and also a lawyer, hmm. right? And so part of it is somebody's got to take the arrows out front, right? Uh, and so being principled and being bold sometimes means that you like put yourself in harm's way. You put yourself in the in the trajectory. Um, um, but also, yeah, I mean, we, I'll say this, voter suppression in Georgia and across the country has gotten much more sophisticated, right? So it's not just Bubba on the back of a pickup truck trying to intimidate black voters mm -hmm. with a shotgun, mm -hmm. right? That it is exact match. It is these massive purges. It's, you know, uh, ignoring the formula for the number of machines that you need per voter. It's, uh, it's, the machines in Georgia, that's a whole nother process, uh, like a whole nother conversation uh, mm -hmm. that I just get enraged about. And so I say that to say that voter suppression has become much more sophisticated. And it is our responsibility as advocates and people who do this work to meet that sophistication with sophistication, right? So you can't say that you're going to register a million black people in Georgia and mean it without having a full on legal defense and offensive strategy, a full on communication strategy, and then garden variety, community organizing, grassroots organizing, boots on the ground strategy. That these, like, we're not going to tweet ourselves towards justice. Right. Right. Like and that you need a multi prong all... attack. It's a multi prong attack, absolutely. And it has been since day zero. Right. So, who do you look to, or who would you say are your, your predecessors for the New Georgia Project, or are you something brand new? I mean, you mentioned the Korean American mm -hmm. registration, but. Where else do you see yourself fitting into that genealogy? Yeah, um, so I, I joke a lot. This ain't your daddy's civil rights movement. <laughs> um, so essentially, I tell people like we are a tech startup inside of a civil rights and voting rights organization. We've built a number of mobile apps um, that are designed to address some of this really aggressive voter suppression that was oversaw, obviously, by Secretary now Governor Elect Kemp. Uh, but, um, <clears throat> but, it, but it's been going on for decades. Right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so, um, you know, I like as individuals, right. I think about people like Ella Baker, um, and then as like entities, SNCC is super important. They have a very, very rich legacy, mm -hmm. um, of sort of bold action in the face of state violence. Um, and you know, again, the that multi prong approach, right, where mm -hmm. you are thinking about the legal strategy, the communication strategy, <clears throat> the field strategy and the boots on the ground. Um, I definitely think that we sort of do work in that mold. Um, um, but so I would never deign to say that what we're doing is sort of new and unprecedented. Sure. Right? But what I will say is that um, the 
the space that we occupy, right, at the center of, or at the intersection of uh, leveraging technology to address justice issues, uh, while centering the leadership of people of color and women and queer folks in the American South, might be unprecedented. <laughs> I think that's fair to say. New. <laughs> right. Unchartered territory. Right. And hopefully let more and more chartered. Absolutely. But um, we've also, again, and have taken a lot of arrows, right, by standing out front in front of our, I mean, but we are a part of an ecosystem. Sure. There are tons of groups who do this work and who we toil along with, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the being sort of expansive has created space. Right. For okay. folks to think about how to do this work differently um, and to challenge assumptions about politics in Georgia. I think one of the things that we consistently had to battle against was the assumption that, you know, black people don't vote. White people are racist. Mm -hmm. Latinos aren't citizens. Mm -hmm. Asian Americans are multi conservatives or don't are apolitical and young people are unreliable and women vote like their husbands. There's so many assumptions built into all of that. Right. 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 Um, and it is our responsibility and the work of the New Georgia Project to challenge those assumptions. Right. Um, and to, again, build a permanent, um, like sophisticated infrastructure um, that can hold, again, the aspirations and uh, of Georgia's majority, their, their rising majority. Right, so to make that transition from even just the stereotype of being a minority, mm -hmm. once people become the major majority, right. can they shift their thinking and One. embrace that? 100 and it's not going to happen by osmosis it's not going to happen automatically we have to actively proactively do that work right so what so majority minority feels like it doesn't actually capture the direction that we're moving in mm -hmm. into the story because we are not minorities at the in 2024 2025 when georgia flips people of color will be the majority right so what is the what is the, what is the new what, known right, culture right, for that? Right. And instead of like getting caught flat footed and waiting for that moment to arrive, mm -hmm. we're actively pushing and thinking and pushing ourselves and asking those questions of our legislators, of voters, um, as we sort of build a more responsive democracy. Listen, the minimum wage in Georgia is $5.15. I still haven't met a Georgian, who, I, who a serious person, who thinks that that's okay. How, outside of the legislature. <laughs> all, <laughs> That's of the, a all of the people who think it is are in one place. You're are, are in one place, yeah. right? And how is that possible? Like, they are not fearful of losing their jobs uh, and for being wholly and completely unaccountable to the people mm -hmm. of Georgia. There's no one that, uh, outside of the Georgia State Legislature, uh, that I've come into contact with that thinks that um, an abortion ban uh, is is the is is reflective of the mood of j the people who give birth uh, in in Georgia, like the Georgians who give birth. That's not they they are not aligned mm -hmm. uh, with that kind of thinking, and yet these that attitude, those beliefs proliferate through the Georgia State Legislature. How? Um, and I think part of it is because. Uh, They've been able to manipulate our electoral system. They've been able to manipulate our elections in ways that they are not fearful of the backlash from voters, and we're working to change that. And do you think, and this might be getting a little bit ahead because I want to talk more about like the the day to day, the nitty gritty of of what the Georgia Project does. But do you think? I mean, obviously, the preference would have been to see for your organization, for many people in the state to see Stacey Abrams win. Mm. But how, what kind of message do you think what happened, what, is that, what message sent, does that send to the state? Right. That it's in, the message that it sends to the state is that Republicans are desperate. That um, in the marketplace of ideas, where you are putting forth your vision for the future in front of voters and citizens, that the Republicans are essentially bankrupt. Uh, 
and that they are unable to compete fairly in the marketplace of ideas. And so they have to cheat and rig elections, steal elections. Um, listen, Georgians voted on machines that were 18 years old and old enough to vote themselves. Um, the Secretary of State, the sort of chief elections officer, the CEO of Elections Inc. in the state of Georgia was allowed to oversee and administer the election in which he was a candidate at the top of the ticket. And when we screamed as sort of good government, government transparency, voting rights and civil rights groups, not in a partisan way, mm -hmm. um, we either got the, well, I mean, he can do it. Like it's, it's not illegal. Right. Um, or the like, well, what do you expect? It's Georgia, it's the South. Like they do racist things. It's, it's what it's we just, do. How are you surprised just, by that? Why are you surprised by that? None of those answers are acceptable. No, well, they're right? not really answers. And they're not really answers, exactly. Um, and so, um, I mean, I, I, the, the, it was like desperate times call for desperate measures. And so I think that, um, you know, what we say, how we characterize the election is that um, if it's a fair fight, uh, Georgia Republicans uh, are looking at a, a, a rapidly closing window um, for their influence. And that um, if they are to continue to hold power, it's either going to be a fundamental shift back to the center so that they are able to meet Georgians where they are and lead us into the future, mm -hmm. or they are going to be eliminated, um, or they're going to continue to cheat and get more and more desperate and do more and more um, like unconstitutional, illegal, immoral, unacceptable things in order to like keep their cold, hands on the reins of power mm -hmm. right so, so it, we're, and that's probably not sustainable and it's not sustainable uh and there will come a time where we will have again a department of justice that cares about the rule of law uh we'll have a secretary of state uh that cares about maintaining the integrity of georgia's election system mm -hmm. um, and that sees our election system as critical infrastructure uh those days will come and we'll have an electorate that will be so mobilized and so incensed by what they're seeing that it will be able that their turnout will be overwhelming and it will overcome all of their voter suppression tactics and schemes and that I mean and so <laughs> I mean I know it's cliche because I grew up in Atlanta to quote King uh, right <laughs> but like he says that the arc of the moral universe is long but that it bends towards justice mm -hmm. right it's long <laughs> it's longer than you maybe ever knew. It is long, but ultimately it bends towards justice, and, mm -hmm. and I fundamentally believe that. Uh, and we and we see evidence and signs of it happening, which is why they fight so hard to discredit us, discredit the work, and neutralize the impact that we're having on the electorate. So that that fight was a sign, almost of your success, of the success of organizers, of the success 100%. of... 100%. Listen, we talked to 3 million people of color uh, in, 20, just in, 20... just in 2018. Wow. Just in 2018. 3 million conversations about healthcare, about childcare, about education, about Plant Vogel, right? Mm -hmm. The idea that George is building not one, but two new nuclear power plants uh, in the state. And there haven't been any new nuclear power plants built anywhere in the U.S. in 30 years, right? We're talking about bail reform and cash bail. Um, and we're talking about voting and voting rights. We're talking about, listen, we had a, a campaign, um, our 18 by 18 campaign this year. And we began at the beginning, at the top of the year, with a plan to register 1,800 18-year-olds 18 in 2018. We were so okay. proud of ourselves, super excited about very, it. Very clever sounding and right? catchy. Alliteration, yes. I'm into it. Uh, and then Parkland happened. Mm. The Parkland shooting happened. And we started to get phone calls from student government presidents, from PTA parents, from 
guidance counselors and school principals saying, hey, will you come? Our young people want to have a voter registration drive. Will you come and do your 18 by 18 thing uh, during our lunch break? Yes, we will. <laughs> we most certainly will. Uh, absolutely. And I'm bringing stickers with us too, right? Yeah. Uh, and so what went from a campaign and a plan to register 1,800 voters, um, 18 year olds became 18,000 18 year olds in 2018 alone, right? Yeah. And then we started to, but because we don't just do voter registration, right? It's voter registration, it's education, it's mobilization, it's getting in deep community with mm -hmm. these people so that we can actually win, like for real. Um, we started talking to these young people and they wanted to know who the NRA supported so that they could vote against them. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, which led to us making some tweaks and designs and building an app uh, that spoke focused specifically on um, the midterm elections in Georgia and campaign finance. So like Coca-Cola, who do they give money to? Home Depot, who do they give money to? Mm -hmm. They all are Georgia based companies like they're apparently political actors, just like you are. Right. We should know this. Right. Let's go to the New Georgia Project app to figure it out, right? Um, and so having, again, conversations with 3 million young people and, and people of and color. To get them aware so early that everything is political. Even these businesses that they're like, they're like, well, they sell paint and lumber. They're right. not political. Yeah. Oh, but they are. Absolutely. Or, and, bubbly soft drink from that place. And it's, yeah. just, it's just a, uh, a fizzy, sugary drink. <laughs> <laughs> it's refreshing. Yeah. Uh, but they also have an agenda, right? Mm -hmm. Like, um, and... And they have, they, they put their thumb on the scale. They want to pick winners and losers as well. And so be, having a more sophisticated analysis um, and has also been sort of part of the work that we're doing to build super voters and to turn um, young people and people of color into super voters. Um, we simply define super voters as people who vote in every election that they're eligible to vote in. Um, and we believe that super voters are not born that they're made, mm -hmm. right? So, um, and you don't have to be a white man over 60 to, uh, be to be a super voter, right? And so how are they made, right? And mm -hmm. so learning that, learning from campaigns past, right? Campaigns super serve them with messaging. They know the podcasts that they listen to. They know where they go grocery shopping. They know their hopes. They know their fears. And so while there are a lot of people who put themselves out as experts in mm -hmm. young people's political behavior and black people's political behavior, they tend to not have the receipts to back it up. Okay. And we do. Right? Okay, right. And so I think that that's also the difference in the work that we do is that, um, you know, these three million conversations, it's not idle chatter, that it is designed to develop, to continue to refine our message, but to develop a deep, deep understanding of the direction that the state needs to go in. So how does this look day to day? You, you've talked a little bit about how you're a tech company in right. the shell of a civil rights organization. Yeah. Um, you, you have these apps, you're yeah. having these 3,000 conversations, you're going to schools, but what, what's happening day to day and you're, you're not just you here in this office. No, no. no. so uh, we have 10 offices across the state of Georgia. Um, we're up in all of the seven cities, right? So um, Augusta, I was, I'm gonna test myself right now. <laughs> uh, Augusta, Atlanta, Macon, um, Columbus, Albany, Valdosta, Savannah, uh, yeah. Good job. <laughs> um, and then we also had an office in Dawson, Georgia, okay. uh, in Riverdale, and in Norcross. Okay. Right. So that's no the Athens. Time. No Athens. Hmm. Um, but we are we look at, we're looking to expand. Okay. Um, and I can definitely make tons of re like I can make a solid case for why we need to be in Clark County. Mm -hmm. um, so. You know, soon come. Coming, We're raising coming money. Coming soon to a Coming near soon, you. absolutely, absolutely. However, we've registered thousands of people in Clark County because Before you don't of, need to be there. Right, right. To do. But I mean, I think that as again, we think about what the community organizing, like the grassroots organizing aspect is, mm -hmm. um, and we also go to places where we're invited. Right. Okay. Right. So oftentimes what will happen, I mean, that's why we're in Dawson. Right. We went down to Randolph County because uh, 
in Southwest Georgia because Randolph County wanted to close seven out of the nine polling locations in between the highest turnout midterm and what was going to be the highest turnout general election in the county's history. So all of these people of color, all of these young people energized and enthused and came out to vote in the primaries. And then you're gonna close 80% of their polling locations to sow seeds of confusion in the weeks and months in front of the general election. It's not okay. Mm -hmm. And so those are the games that people play. And because folks were enraged and incensed by what was happening, we opened up an office there uh, where we're organizing with local leaders um, to address, again, long-term issues and how to build power and how do we maintain and protect the integrity of our elections. So, you know, I think there's so much emphasis and, and focus. People are like, well, it's 2018, the midterms are coming, mm. 2020, yeah. but it's that's not how it works that's right. no, you know i mean you get maybe more there's more publicity right like if if the secretary of state's office does something like purging the rolls which they're going to do also when it, an election is coming up if they're going to do it but you know the the media is focused on that but how do you keep up your your work what is happening right. in 2019 right um we are committed to building super voters right the super voters vote in every election in which they're eligible we have hundreds of elections in Georgia in 2019. Um, you know, because of the work that we've done, so a lot of people know about Flint, Michigan, right? right. And how the government and um, the governor and the legislature in the state of Michigan tried to poison the residents of Flint, did poison the residents of Flint, um, and the impact that it's had on people's health and the long-term sort of economy, it's, it's terrible. What people also don't know is that there's several cities in the state of Georgia that have alarming levels of contaminants in the water that people drink. Um, and I believe that after the Flint incident, um, the Atlanta Public School Board and the DeKalb County School Board took it upon themselves to test the water sources that our babies are drinking out of. Every and, day. And, right, every day and found alarming levels of lead in over half of the schools. To their credit, they immediately went into action um, to remediate those issues, right? Mm -hmm. um, without having to be prompt, without having to be organized. Uh, I mean, they were still organized. We had parents showing up, sure. there, right? Um, but, th but the point is that they, they took immediate action. So, that is an important lesson in what the school board can do and is able to do, right? Mm -hmm. People don't know what school board members do. People don't know what the lieutenant governor does. People don't know what the like county water supervisor does, what the mayor does. Mm -hmm. And so part of the work of the New Georgia Project is to not only, again, do this type of voter education where people have real life, like are able to wrap both arms around who these local elected officials are and why these races matter, mm -hmm. why local elections matter, right? So as we build the bridge to 2020, it is going to be over the waters of a bunch of several hundred 2019 municipal elections all across the state of Georgia. Yeah. Which, as you just said, are so vital and, and don't come up in the in the conversation, in the narrative about what's what's happening. Right. So, I, you know, people have already started talking about, like, 2020, is Leader Abrams going to run for president? Is Beto O'Rourke going to run for president? Like, who's Obama? Like, there's 2019. Right. <laughs> yeah. there's... there's 2019. And, and I get and I understand what it requires to build a presidential campaign, mm -hmm. but... The minimum wage is still on the table in Georgia. The legislative session starts on January 14th, right? Uh, we need to buy new voting machines in Georgia. We have a secretary of state that I'm elect who we're not clear where he stands on anything that matters at all to us about voting. And so there's work to be done this year mm -hmm. that is going to be vital in sort of seeding uh, the work of 2020. 
All right, and in the time remaining, um, let's talk a little bit about, you know, saying looking ahead to 2019, mm -hmm. that the, there's work to be done in these, what people would consider interim years, but they really aren't. Um, where's the New Georgia Project going? What's its plans for the future? Yeah. Um, What's your plans for it for the future? Yes. Well, the New Georgia Project has very ambitious plans for the future. We're actually really excited about it, right? So our plan in 2019 is to register an additional 50,000 Georgians, right? Bringing our total number up to just above 350,000 people registered. Um, our plan in 2019 also includes, um, we're going to have a hackathon, right? So it's where we... So our hackathons in the past have been where we brought in computer programmers and like... Mm -hmm. um, like software developers, uh, coders, designers, um, along with uh, people who've been purged from the voter rolls, formerly incarcerated people, our um, canvassers and organizers, voting rights lawyers, voting rights activists. We put them on teams and they compete against one another to come up with mobile apps, mm -hmm. uh, to like civic engagement apps to make it easier uh, to register to vote, easier to do voter education. So a lot of our technology ideas come out of these sort of convenings. Um, because esports is so huge, and now Atlanta has like is home to an esports league where like is people get paid to pay, play video games. Really? Um, we are doing a hackathon with a special focus on video games, okay. uh, gaming, and the, the goal is to gamify civic engagement. So how do we uh, build super voters? How do we create super voters? How do we have um, really, really active and engaged citizenry mm -hmm. um, through video games? Uh, so I think people are familiar, for example, with like the Fitbit, right? And the idea that it's sort of communal, right? And it's, um, you know, Mary Sue walked 15 miles today. Mary and she, Sue is an overachiever. She, Mary Sue is such an overachiever. Uh, but she walked 15 miles today, so, and you got a badge for, like, you know, exercising 30 days in a row, um, et cetera. And then that gets shared with your social network mm -hmm. um, automatically through this wearable technology. So, like, what are the applications to politics and the applications to civic engagement? Um, and so we're going to bring a bunch of gamers in a room with a bunch of voting rights lawyers and then a bunch of, like, ordinarily regular folk uh, and try to and, and to see what happens. So we're really excited about that in 2019 as well. Uh, we want to get a bunch of progressive mayors elected mm -hmm. on our C4 side. Uh, you know, what would it look like to have run slates of young people to take over school boards uh, across the state? Um, so, again, we are being really thoughtful and deliberate and intentional about how we move through 2019. We're not going to speed through 2019 sure. um, to get to strategy. 2020. There's a ton of strategy. Um, you know, we're prepared for the legislative session. It looks like they're going to buy new machines finally, um, you know, because we had several people report to us during early voting and on election day that the machines voted, that flipped their votes, uh, that they went in to vote for one candidate and... When they went to review. And when they went to review, there was another candidate's name there, right? And that can be addressed, right? Mm -hmm. um, there are tons of people who, you know, um, when they walked out of the polling location, were like, well, did I? Did, was my vote flipped? Did I vote for who I thought? Of, did I fill out the ballot completely? Um, in French, they call that uh, l'esprit d'escalier. So it's the spirit of the stairs. So when you get to the top of the stairs, you figure, like, wait, why am I here? Why did I come upstairs? <laughs> what am I doing? Um, so that, like, afterthought where you're questioning mm -hmm. what happens. And that happens to a lot of people, particularly when voting. Um, the problem is that there's no way to independently verify an individual's vote. Uh, so there's no paper trail. There's no receipts. Uh, Not and that's just a, for the forgetful person to go back and assure themselves, but right, for, for anyone, anybody. For anyone. And so, you know, we're taking that issue to the legislature, mm -hmm. right? We're taking the issue to the legislature this year that um, you have to register to vote. 30 days before an election, um, but 
there is no requirement that the state or counties process your voter registration form on any particular timeline. So if you get your completed accurate voter registration form in 31 days before an election, it is completely possible in Georgia that your application won't be processed in time enough for you to vote in that election. Hmm. That's a problem. Yeah. There are tons of states around the country that say, you know, after a form has been submitted, that like the, it will be processed within 30 days. You it's, have a deadline, and so do we. You have a deadline, and so do we. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and so we are, you know, we want to push that through a Georgia Voter Bill of Rights, a Voting Rights Act, essentially for Georgians um, and Georgia elections. Um, also on the agenda for 2019. A lot. A lot. A lot to do. You need to go home and rest. Yeah. But before you do, I have one more question for you. Um, the number of interviews, and, and you've been interviewed so extensively, and especially surrounding oh this. <laughs> Is it a lot? It's Is it a lot? lot. It's a lot. Okay. Um, especially surrounding this election. But one thing um, that comes up again and again that you've been quoted as saying is um, is is that you know this voting suppression and especially what happened in the 2018 race for Georgia's governor is Jim Crow's last stand. Mm. What's it going to take to actually? make it Jim Crow's last stand? Because it seems like it was close this time, but not completely. I, so when will it be good and dead? Um, it wasn't close this time. The election was stolen. Like, there's just no... I'm super clear about that. Mm -hmm. What it's going to take is for us to um, treat this like the threat that it is to our democracy. Part of me thinks that people are waiting for the president to come on television one night and say, you know, democracy, we're off that. Elections, we're done with that. We live in a fascist, like under a fascist regime. This is a dictatorship now, deal with it. Good night, yeah. right? It's never gonna be that clear. Mm -hmm. It's never gonna be that articulate and that like, uh, open and blatant. I mean, what's happening in Wisconsin is kind of naked in terms of its like awfulness, sure. as is what's happening in North Carolina and in Michigan. Mm -hmm. But folks are waiting for it to be like, the KKK is out in full hoods in the black neighborhood, like physically blocking people from voting. It's terrible, let's do something about it. Now is the time. Right, right, now is the time to do something about it. It's never gonna be that clear. And so if we don't start taking, so what is it? It's going to take us to accept that this is happening, that you are not making this up, right? That they are stealing our elections, that their desperation is required, is causing them to do awful things that um, are leading us to question our institutions, like the media, what's real news, what's fake news, right? Um, our elections. Does my vote count? Why should I count anyway? They're gonna steal the election, et cetera. Um, that people have to take this threat seriously and begin to sort of respond um, appropriately to the to to the actual threat to our democracy, um, and not like just shrug our hands and wait for it to get really, really, really obviously bad before we do something. Well, and say we thought. Thank you so much for taking the time to sit with the Two Party Georgia Project today. Yay. We have so much more we could talk about, for sure. um, and maybe we can in the future. But thanks again for adding to the historical record. Thank you for having me. This was fun.